Hello, Kidney Warriors! James here from Dadvice TV, your online kidney health coach, and this is Dadvice TV Live. Now, if you're new, go ahead and introduce yourself in the comments. We have an amazing and supportive, positive and helpful community here to help others, their friends, their families, their coworkers who have chronic kidney disease. And you're gonna find it's just ah, an unbelievable community. Now, if you are new, let me quickly tell you a little bit about myself. My name is James and I created Dadvice TV, oh, just over two years ago. Now, why? Because I got pretty sick and I ended up in the ER where they put me in the ICU for a week and then told me, hey, James, you've got kidney disease. Not even that, it was James, your kidneys are failing. You need to go on dialysis. You need to get on the transplant list. Your life is gonna change. Well, whew, that was quite a shocker. And another shocker, I never went on dialysis. I never got a kidney transplant. Instead, I got a little bit of luck. I changed my diet. I changed my lifestyle. I started walking. I started doing things. I started enjoying life a lot more and seeing things a lot differently. I watched what I ate. I said goodbye, Gallant Wendy's. Goodbye, Mr. Burger King. Got rid of all that stuff. Worked with my doctor, got my blood pressure under control, and pretty much got my health all straightened out and under control. Now, by getting healthy, it helped me improve my overall health and my kidney health, and it raised up my lab values, helped me get rid of all my symptoms, and I went from a single digit GFR of eight, which is not very good, all the way up into the 30s, and I feel amazing. I do not let kidney disease hold me down. Now tonight, <clears throat> we are here to talk about hope. And I hope is a very important and a very big word to me. Um, as a matter of fact, you guys notice back there when I start the opening for Dadvice TV, the first phrase is discover hope. And when you go to dadvicetv.com, my website, the first thing you see is discover hope. And a lot of people, they email me, and I'm going to tear up now. i got to be careful how I talk about this. They email me, and they say, James, when we hear those three words, we know we're in for something that's going to help give us hope. And those three words are Hello Kidney Warriors, which is the phrase that I start every video with. Hope is also what kept me going. I hoped for better tomorrows. I hope for more tomorrows. I wanted my kids to see me do something more impactful with my life. Because when I was diagnosed, the outcome was not good. They told me if I didn't go on dialysis, I wouldn't make it to my next birthday. That within 45 days, I just wouldn't be here. So I had, I was using hope to help motivate me and keep me going. So hope is our topic tonight. And I know when you guys are here, that's what you're looking for. You're looking for hope, ways that you can improve your quality of life while living with kidney disease, not letting it hold you down. And when we have different guests here, like, like Jen and Dr. Butt and Dr. Rosansky and all of them, they also bring you hope by sharing information and helping empower you and motivate you. Well, today for her first time here, we have someone very new, very important to me to talk about hope. So I want to introduce you guys to our guest, her very first visit here. Go ahead and say hello to Lana Leip. Hello, Lana. How you doing? Hi, guys. Hi, kidney family. Now tell them who you are and a little bit about your background. Yeah. So I am a licensed clinical social worker. And for those of you who don't know what that means, you're in the, the majority. A lot of people do struggle with trying to figure out exactly what social workers do. Um, but we are in a variety of different settings. We're in hospitals, we're in local clinics. We you know, work in legislation, we're therapists, we work in schools. We're trained with mental health. Um, we're trained with you know, connecting 
our clients and their loved ones to resources. I mean, the, I could talk about social work and how wonderful um, this profession is, but um, what I do is I have gotten my master's degree from the University of Maryland School of Social Work. I worked in two ICUs out at the Baltimore VA Medical Center, as well as a nursing home that also had a respiratory unit um, and a skilled nursing facility kind of all combined. Um, since living here in Honolulu, Hawaii, it's, I know you don't feel bad for me in that cold weather, you guys are both <laughs> experiencing. Um, and, you know, I, I worked in two ICUs here as well, um, up until November, and I also worked for a nonprofit kidney agency, um, which is where I met the lovely Jen that you all know and love so very much. Um, and now I am in a private practice setting where I am working with people one-on-one, -on -one, getting into like the nitty gritty of, you know, their experiences and, and really just trying to advocate, you know, for, for better tomorrows for them. Awesome. Um, all, okay. Sorry to interrupt. Go ahead. No, I was going to say in, <laughs> and in the work that I've done, hope has been a constant theme, you know, from, you know, working in college with my colleagues, patients, their families, our communities. And I think, you know, given everything going on currently with, you know, COVID-19, hope is something that a lot of people are really searching for. So I'm happy to talk about it today. So thank you. Awesome. Awesome. And a few people have said you sound a little, uh, you, you, you sat back a little bit further and you sound a little bit softer than we were earlier. <laughs> okay. Yeah, there we go. And I've, I've, I've made you a little bit louder. So hopefully that helps those that are having a little difficulty hearing you. And I'm going to turn me down just a hair in case they turn their volume up. I'm not overpowering you. <laughs> so in your opinion, and you know, hope is a word that we, we use so often, especially those of us with chronic illnesses like chronic kidney disease or pretty much any other illness out there. We use the word hope quite often. In your opinion, and in, from your experience, what does hope mean? Yeah, I think hope is as unique of a definition as every person is unique. I think hope shows up in different ways for every single person and in every single situation. It's, you know, our, our cultures help us kind of, you know, um, process hope and have a lens of hope in a certain way. If you're religious or spiritual, you know, that's, that's another way that, that hope shows up. Um, but it is a universal experience that we all have. Um, to put a definition to it, I mean, there are many, there are many, many definitions of hope, but it is, the desire and the belief that there are better days ahead, that there are better situations to be had and finding ways to achieve those. So it goes beyond wishful thinking like, man, I wish, you know, COVID would be over, man, I wish, you know, my kidney function would, um, you know, go back up. It's, it's trying to figure out areas that you want things to be different and then areas that you can, you can control a little bit of that outcome. Yep. Awesome. Now, is there, um, is there more of like, Hey, can we, I mean, we can't see or touch or say, yeah, that is hope right there. Yeah. But is there, and I've heard that there, there's kind of like a science to hope. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So unfortunately the, the research around hope wasn't really there until like the early two thousands. Um, and I, I still feel like the, our understanding of hope and chronic conditions and overcoming a lot of the challenges that we have, I still don't think that it's very widely researched as much as it should be. However, there are many positive psychologists, there are a number of researchers, there are a lot of doctors and scientists who, you know, tend to be more procedure oriented, not so much like the feelings and abstract, you know, concepts like hope. Um, who have actually started to prescribe hope in their treatment plan. Mm. So, yeah. In, so, so how do they prescribe hope? It's in my work in the ICU, I worked a lot of times with um, our pain and palliative care team. Mm -hmm. And so they were the ones who come in and, you know, they help us figure out hope and 
what is the best way that we can improve somebody's quality of life? And in describing what someone's situation is, you know, we can talk about them being a cluster of symptoms. Oh, you have, Mm -hmm. you know, end stage renal disease. This is the cluster of symptoms. This is, you know, the data behind it. But we fail oftentimes to look at the person who is living with these symptoms. I was just about to say that. I I think a lot of our audience, and I'm one of them, so many times when I visit a doctor, I feel that that's all I am is a collection of symptoms and problems. They don't see me as a person. Now, my primary care physician, who is awesome, he sees me as a person first. That's exactly how the difference between him and other doctors that I don't really care for much is he Mm -hmm. sees me first as a person with some challenges. And he uses that word challenges instead of illness, sickness, problems, all these kind of negative words. A challenge is something I can overcome. And I think that's why he does that. Absolutely, And an illness, especially a chronic illness, well, that's forever. You know, so it's not a positive statement, really. No. But I, I like that comment that, you know, the 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 seeing us as a person, that, that is a real thing that I think resonates so much with so many people out there. Yeah. And, and in prescribing hope, I mean, you know, doctors can get a pad out there and write it down on there if they have to. But yeah. it's, it's but it's really about looking at that person as a whole, seeing what their limitations are. Because if someone has chronic kidney disease and they live maybe in like a food desert, like areas where access to healthy, fresh and nutritious foods is difficult, you can say you want someone to eat well all you want, but that's not really getting to that person and really seeing what their needs are, their challenges and their limitations might be as well as their strengths. Yep, exactly. Now, do you have any examples of of this from your from your career working? I know you've seen so much, and and you and I have talked about the the things that you've done in the hospital. You're you've been in a position where hope is, you know, one of the last options for people. Um, can you share some stories of hope from your experiences? Yeah, I, you know, in working in the ICU here in in Honolulu. I can tell you with COVID especially, I mean, hope has been the thing. It is quintessential for our our families, especially when, you know, most of the time in the ICU, my patients can't always speak to me. So it's it's usually relying on the voices of their loved ones, their caregivers to, you know, act as that megaphone for, you know, their voice and and their dignity and, and who they are as a person, because I only get to meet them at this very, very critical point in a small, small, small portion of their their chapter of their book of life. So Mm -hmm. a lot of times when when people come in, you know, it's it's okay, let's get you back to full recovery. Well, first it's let's survive this acute acute crisis that we're in. But the goal is to always get that person, the person they love so much, back to a previous level of functioning. And sometimes that's possible. It, It really is. I've seen really, really dire situations where we have seen people leave the ICU and go on and then come back and visit us months later and just glowing, you know. <laughs> I was it's, it's one wonderful. of those. I, you know, I spent a week in the ICU and there was this one nurse, Tatiana, um, and I, I felt like I spent like a month with her, even though I was only there for a week. <laughs> She was one that was always there. When my eyes were waking up, she was coming in the room to do something. Um, When I hit that button, like, hey, I got to go to the bathroom. Uh, I had so many things connected. I had to call them, wait for them to get up. And (laughs) it seemed like it took me 20 minutes to to go four feet to the restroom. But she was always there. And she saw me pretty much at my worst, you know, so sick and my low energy and I started getting better afterwards and I made sure and I, one of my doctor visits there, I I asked, is she working today? I would love to just stop by, say hello and let her see Mm -hmm. how much better I am. Cause I I have a feeling, you know, she sees a lot 
like you see a lot and the outcome isn't mm -hmm. always them leaving on their own in the ho from the hospital. Sure. Um, and I just wanted to kind of do that, say hello and, and, you know, let her know. I remember you being there and it really made for me a huge impact because you know, you're alone when you're in mm -hmm. the hospital for so much of the time, your family can only visit certain hours and you know, life's happening. You know, they've got kids and things to take care of. Um, but I was one of those that, you know, I made sure to go back and, and see her and, and say hello. Um, cause I just remember, I still remember her name to this day and I'm awful with names. So that tells you yeah. how much of an impact she made. And I think that's a really, really important point that you made because bedside manner matters. The language that our providers use when we are sick or when our loved ones are sick matters. And it really does make or break an experience that's already stressful. You will remember your nurse, your doctor, your respiratory therapist, whomever, for the rest of your life. And it's so crucial as healthcare professionals that we remember that, that we remember that they're, that is a person, that is someone's dad, brother, mom, sister, you know, in that room, not, not a cluster of symptoms like we talked about. Yeah, exactly. And, and when you mentioned that, um, we'll remember them for forever, you know, and, and the, talking to us as a person, I also, and so will my wife remember my first nephrologist, the one that I didn't get to pick her. She was there in the ICU when I was there, her bedside manner. <laughs> it's awful. <laughs> She's no longer employed there. She left. It, it wasn't the career for her. But um, yeah, it was very blunt, very to the point, uh, mm -hmm. sometimes a, a bit too to the point. And there were times where I needed her to be that way because I was in sure. denial that this is food poisoning. Those tests are wrong. Do you know how much Mucinex I took for this cough that won't go away? <laughs> you know, ibuprofen for the headache and this metallic taste in my mouth and all those mm -hmm. symptoms. Um, but I will always remember and so my wife, us sitting there, you know, I'm laying in the bed, tubes all hooked up to me. My wife's there. And when she said, you know, this is serious, you are going to die in 45 days if you don't, or she said, if you don't go on dialysis within 45 days, your wife will be picking out your casket. And I'm like, my wife was in shock. It just, it, it, it emotionally destroyed her standing there hearing that and matter of fact my wife doesn't like or did not like to go to the doctor and get things checked up she mm -hmm. went home called our doctor and said look i've had this thing i've been ignoring i need it checked out if if my husband isn't here i have to be here for the kids so it kind mm -hmm. of you know it impacted both of us from her bad bedside manners so it's really really important to have um, you know, like you said, they got to remember we are people, we're fathers, we're brothers, sisters, sons, daughters. Mm -hmm. We need to be talked to that way, you know, treated yeah. that way. Um, and we'll, we'll remember the good and the bad forever. Absolutely. And that, that tells a lot about, you know, if people are already reluctant to go to the doctor and here they are in this terrible, terrible, acute situation. And then we shame them, we minimize their concerns, we invalidate their experience. We, we don't take the time to ensure that they really understand. How likely are they going to want to come back or go seek out another provider if this is exactly. the experience they have? Yeah, and they need to come back. They need to do the follow-up. They need to also, follow the instruction, listen to the instructions that they're given, follow them, you know, implement them as well as come back. And if they're not, if, if that conversation just isn't done correctly, the, and I, I see this quite often, the, the patient is so frustrated. They don't really listen. They don't remember what they were supposed to do. They don't care whatever the, they were, you know, we're told they need to do because uh, they 
just the way they feel. You know, it, it wasn't that – it's hard to describe. It just – you know, I, I've been there, and I know a lot of people listening have been there. Um, but, yeah, it plays such an important role. And you have to remember as well that people are – getting these life-changing diagnoses. I mean, you didn't think you had any problems with your, your kidney function. And so that's, that's grief. That's, that's grieving what, you know, future possibilities. That's grieving oh, certain yeah. elements of your health. And to ignore that is actually very, very detrimental. It can be really, really detrimental. Yeah, and it's, I mean, it's an unimaginable sudden burden I and mean, i remember mm-hmm. you know <clears throat> later that afternoon or later in the evening it's no visiting hour and we never even told my kids we told them daddy's on a trip because i travel all the time um so, so we didn't want to worry them and we didn't know what to tell them or how to explain because they're tiny little kids but i remember yeah. laying there thinking of my future what's it gonna be you know and i'm googling stuff and oh my god goodness it's all negative um uh, and i was worried and i'm i remember thinking maybe i should talk to my dad's brother who was a minister i was like maybe i should call uncle jay talk to him about this um so much just goes through your mind and, and you're making decisions with very limited data um and not really able to think clear not only not able to think clear because you just were told some heavy, heavy news. It's, you know, extremely mm-hmm. disturbing and bothersome, but you've got the toxins and the other issues, your health, and that can't, you know, that keeps you from thinking straight. It is just, you know, so challenging. And, and the, the reason I'm, I'm mentioning all this and I'm glad you brought it up is that's normal. And that's something we have mm-hmm. to deal with suppressing it, pushing it to the back of our mind doesn't let us start working through it. And it took me, you know, several days to kind of work through at least the first layer. It was like an onion to get through that Mm -hmm. first layer and realize, okay, here's my plan. Actually, that's what I did. I made a plan. I was like, I'm going to make a plan. Um, I had my wife bring in my computer. I, I'd, I'd gone on Amazon. I was like, there's too much stuff here to, to write down. I can't write down enough notes. I ordered a laser printer, uh, a gigantic box of reams of paper. I just had my whole setup. I'm printing out stuff. Hi- I went through so many <laughs> highlighters, highlighting stuff. The nurses, the doctors, I know, I know they had to think I was crazy, but I was like, I, I'm going to you know, outsmart kidney disease. I'm going to, yeah. I'm going to science the heck out of this and find something, <laughs> you know, I am determined. <laughs> and, and it, it did work for me, but it wasn't just me alone. I got good news from our family doctor when my wife called him and, you know, about herself, he told her, Hey, I know James. I know he's hearing awful things. Tell him to ignore those. Um, Come see me. The day he gets out, I can help him. Right there. Hope that was support from an external source, someone that I trusted, someone who's smart, someone who's compassionate. Um, And that was part of what had kept me going. Like, okay, I'm going to figure this out. And I just, you know, I was making graphs. It's unbelievable. I was determined to find the cure while I sat there. <laughs> and it is, it, you know, it, it, it motivated me and kept me going. <laughs> and that, that makes a difference is having even one person who's in your corner, who's like, we're not going to give up. Oh we're yeah. We're going to see. Yep. We're going to, we're going to plan. Yeah, and that's one of the things, and, and right now in the comments, I see um, people are supporting each other that are mentioning, hey, here's some challenges I have, and I'm seeing that support. And that is a huge part of hope is when you get that support, when other people are there, the community rallying around, like where I'm seeing right now in the chat group, and, and I see it all the time in the message forums, um, 
to me, that brings in hope. And I see people get inspired and motivated to, you know, okay, well, I'm going to make that doctor's appointment. I'm going to listen to my, my renal dietitian. Um, I'm going to, you know, better accept that there are some limitations or some challenges that I have to face and work through. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, just awesome. Now, can we talk about, um, and we're kind of leading to that in a way, this is in a way where, where is, I'm talking about harnessing, I'm harnessing all these different things for mm -hmm. hope, harnessing hope. Can we talk about how, um, cause that's one of the things you talk about how to harness the power of hope. Can you go through what are the steps, the keys to harnessing it? I think you, you described it perfectly when you were talking about getting this diagnosis and then having to figure out what do I tell my children? Where do I go mm -hmm. from here? And feeling like you're free falling basically. And hope comes into play, especially in our darkest times, especially when we are navigating uncharted territory and the waters seem really, really choppy. It helps us problem solve. It helps us connect to our resources, connect to our support system, who is there for us, who may have experienced this, you know, a similar situation and who just loves us. You know, I mean, at the end of the day, who is there for us, who is going to be there for us in our darkest times. It doesn't matter what religion, spirituality you ascribe to, your political affiliation, what culture you, you know, um, are, are, are in. It's something that we recognize as indescribably powerful and gives us a chance to turn that dial from, okay, you know, I've got this diagnosis of chronic kidney disease. My hope is that I will outsmart chronic kidney disease and regain you know, full function. But if that's not possible, if, you know, I've got to make some changes anyway, let's turn that dial a little bit and look and see, okay, here is where I am now. What kinds of things can I control? What kinds of things do I hope for? And how do we go about it? Yep. So, yeah. Now, now you created a, um, a document that I'm going to link to later after the show in the description for people to download. And in it, you have some steps, um, kind of, kind of steps, not really steps, not like step one, two, three, but it's five points to help you in harnessing the power of hope. Can you go over those? Yeah. And I, I will say it, you're right. It's not steps because every person starts somewhere differently and you know, social workers, we always talk about meeting people where they are. And some people, you know, might need a little extra help. Some people might be like you and like, get me a printer, get me reams of paper now. Let's, you know, <laughs> so every, every person's starting point is going to be different. And, that's and I'll tell okay. you, if I didn't have a little bit of hope and be so stubborn <laughs> and such a nerd, I wouldn't have done that. I would have said, okay, doc, <laughs> they wanted to put an axis in my neck. Go ahead and do it. It's, no, you tell me that's the only option. It's what I have to do. But kind of my stubbornness was like, no, those tests are all wrong. I, I have to be proven a little bit more. And that was my hope. <laughs> you know, was, I'm yeah. going to find information that's going to help me. Either this isn't right, I there the diagnosis is wrong, or there's another option. I'm going to find yeah. it. And I did, which is what's amazing. <laughs> And that is the very, very first point that I bring up in harnessing the power of hope in your own life. And that is understanding your illness. And the very, very first thing that we need to be doing is talking to the experts and do our best to not let them just talk at us, but have them speak to us. Mm -hmm. And the way that we can go around that, I've seen it so many times, the way that I have encouraged my patients and their families to really, really get a good handle on talking to the experts who seem maybe too busy, disinterested, you know, invalidating is to 
ask questions, write them down, write down questions you have, you know, being in the ICU, you've got all of this time or being at home with this new diagnosis, you have this time. What's running through your head? What thoughts are keeping you up at night? What questions are keeping you up at night? Write those down, take those to your doctor and then have a friend, your wife, loved one, go with you to doctor's appointments. Or, you know, if you're at the hospital and there's like a family meeting that, you, that they can participate in, encourage them to participate, have them write down their own questions because two heads are better than one. We know that phrase. And, mm -hmm. you know, I may not be able to hear some information, but you being in the room with me, taking notes, asking questions, there's going to be things that you understand or maybe you're able to hear or maybe questions you might have that are just really going to help improve, you know, my treatment plan overall. Yeah. And I'll tell you, when it comes to understanding the illness, um, just for everyone who's watching, it's not something that's really easy or quick to do. I'm still learning about my, um, when I get, you know, different nephrologists on or, or the renal dietitians are here talking every single episode, sitting here interviewing them, I'm learning something. And if I could, if I could take what I know now and know that back when I was diagnosed, oh, that would have been awesome. And I know I'm still gonna learn more. Three, four, mm -hmm. five years from now, I'll still be learning. Um, so don't be frustrated if you're out there and you're thinking, oh, she, you know, I didn't learn it fast enough. It's It's been mm -hmm. a month since I was diagnosed. I don't still don't know for sure what to eat. Believe me, that is completely right. normal. And those questions, are really the best way to learn. Now, I'd love to have you guys all come here, watch the videos and listen to the <laughs> guests that we have. You're gonna learn stuff here. Um, but those who know me, you know, when I get my labs, I, I'll get them, I get my results, and I try to get them three or four days before my doctor's appointment. I look at the labs, because they're all available online, and I write down my questions. Why? is my phosphorus up? Because you know I was eating what I was told, I was doing what I was told. What do I need to do to get my phosphorus down by our next appointment? And I write all these questions that I have before, days before. And then I'm very lucky, I email them to the doctor. All of my doctors, I told them, here's how I operate and I need you to support me this way. And that's the word, support me this way. I'm going to email you my questions. And then when I go into the doctor's appointment, they're printed out. They already have the answers with, and they're printed with big gaps. And I take a pen and I write the answer just like I'm in school. Cause it helps me yep. to remember it. Cause I'm writing it and I've heard all the words cause I'm writing them as they're talking right. and the doctors see I'm really serious. They don't see this as Oh my goodness, the guy with all the questions again. They see it as like, wow, the guy who actually listens to what we tell him is coming in. And he wants to know about this and this and this and this. They've had a, a day or two to prepare. They know what I'm really concerned about. And sometimes they may not answer them. They may say, you know what? You're, you're concerned about this, this, and this. That really doesn't matter. I heard that so much in the beginning. So I, I was concerned about the wrong things. And every time I'd had those extra questions there and the doctor was like, no, you, you don't need to worry about that part. D don't even ask those questions. Here's where you need to focus. And they might tell me, here's the questions you should be asking. And they helped me understand what really mattered and what I could control. Because I, I can't, you know, asking questions about something I have no control about would just lead me down a path with nothing positive. You yeah. know, I would I would hope that by knowing more, I could change that. But if it's something I can't, no need to focus on that. My doctors are always, let's focus on what you can change and let's take your focus, let's narrow it. And each visit was kind of one thing. Here's what, you got anemia. That's why you're tired all the time. That's why you have no energy, why you, you take naps so often and you still wake up tired. 
let's work on that. And I was always like, but doctor, I got to get my creatinine down. What do I do? Don't worry about creatinine. Don't worry. We're going to focus these other things. It'll take care of itself. And that helped me asking the questions on focusing and better understanding it, which put me on the right path, which is great. And I will say too, that doctors work for you. I mean, you are not inconveniencing them with your questions. There is no question too dumb, too, you know, in, unimportant. There's, there's no question that you can ask that a doctor hasn't heard before. And yep. they are there to help you. And if they are not helping you or, you know, in your experience with that nephrologist in the ICU, oh. get a second opinion. If, if possible, I know there's insurance and co-pays and oh, I got a new nephrologist. Is, is limited, but you know, what I'm, I know there are things that are, that do limit it, such as insurance yeah. and, and co-pays and you know your demographic and where you live. But if possible, get a second opinion because their their opinion is great, but there are other people out there who may have different training, have a different you know perspective, um, and it's not inappropriate to advocate for yourself and to tell them this is what I need and if they're not listening you know get one of your family members to go with you and and help kind of do that extra extra push when you're in the the appointment yeah and we have several people here saying that they make lists they write down questions um perfect advice so what's the next thing next part of harnessing the hope the next part is managing stress so People living with chronic conditions, depression, anxiety, fatigue, anger, frustration, you know, the whole spectrum of moods, emotions, and and physiological symptoms that you can have is, again, is unique to each individual. And it's very easy to feel overwhelmed. It's very, very easy and, and shut down. And so, again, this is something that we can focus on controlling because there's so much that, you know, having a chronic condition we cannot control, but things like managing your diet and exercise, taking your medications regularly as prescribed and asking questions, you know, if if you're having symptoms, you know, from the medications or side effects from the medications. Um, I've often found that listening to music, I love really upbeat, kind of like bounce around the house kind of music. Oh that yeah, gets me Dolly in, Parton, you know, that gets me going every time. <laughs> Better get to, to living, that's that's my third song in the morning I listen to, every morning. <laughs> <laughs> it, sets, it sets the tone for the day, right? It sets your yep. attention for how is the day gonna go. Yeah, and um, when I visit my doctor, my, my primary care physician, who is the number one person taking care of my kidney disease, um, my, my, the nephrologist is there if things go sideways uh, and they're expensive. <laughs> and my primary care physician is much more affordable and easy to get an appointment. <laughs> As a matter of fact, if I need to be in there tomorrow morning, I can be in there tomorrow morning, even though it's all, his office is closed. It's almost seven o'clock at night. I can get in there anytime. But the very first questions he always asks me are all about stress. James, how's the family? How's stress around the house? How's your job? How's other things? How's your, how are you doing with stress? What, what keeps you awake at night or what keeps you from falling asleep? What do you think about when you're going to bed? And we talk about that because he knows how much, how important stress is. And our bodies, there's a hormonal change that happens when we get stress, which is not good for our kidneys. So luckily, I'm an extremely, you know, positive. People might call me that the glass half full guy. I'm not half empty or half full. I'm like, you know what? I bet you we can find a different glass. That's me. (laughs) (laughs) I'm outside the box thinking it completely different. (laughs) It's not full. It's not empty. It's just a different, we need a different glass. That's the answer to it. But managing stress is always the very first topic we always talk about every single visit so and he told me he gave me actually seven steps to managing my kidney disease and one of them 
is managing stress. It's just as poor, important as every other step on there. Yeah. And there, I mean, you can just Google stress management techniques and, and find one that works for you. But one that I really, really love that I'd love for you all to take away. It doesn't matter, you know, if you have physical limitations, if, you know, you've got a house full of people who are always up in your business, this, it's called box breathing and, or square breathing. And it was actually created by the Navy SEALs. And so, you know, Navy SEALs, you hear they're super macho, super fit, super, you know, just go forward, um, you know, kind of people. And box breathing or square breathing, its intention is to get us back into our bodies, get our breathing back in control when we feel like stress or we feel anxious or depressed. And I'll tell you, I, I would leave the ICU oftentimes after a really difficult case and I would be in the elevator, a full elevator with other doctors, social workers, whomever, and I would employ this box breathing exercise and no one knows. It's free, you can do it sitting down, you can do it in your car. Um, so the way that it works is you just imagine a square or a box and you start off by breathing in for four seconds. So you pull in this breath, you hold the breath for four seconds, Exhale for four seconds and then hold the breath again for four seconds. And you just do this over and over again. It's just one technique that I love and it's grounded in research, but it gets us back into the present moment, back into our bodies and helps calm that nervous system that, that can be out of whack when, you know, tensions are running high. And yep. again, it doesn't cost anything. You can do it anywhere. And literally nobody knows you're doing it. I like that. I like that. I'm, I'm, I'm so bad. It's so easy to do breathing exercises, you know, to calm you down, mm -hmm. to help, you know, get you feeling better, kind of center you. It's kind of how I think about it. Mm -hmm. And I forget about them all the time. It's so easy to forget about, but you could do them anywhere, even in the car. And the important thing is not to do it when you're in the middle of crisis. The important thing to do is to practice these things ahead of time and really start working that muscle because just like athletes or, or anybody else, you have to train. And in the middle of crisis is not the time to train, you know, a new muscle or, or a new practice. So, so start doing those things and start figuring out where your, you know, relaxation methods are before you get into a chronic you know, or, or acute stage of anxiety. Yep. Now the next thing on your list is something that's happening right now in the comments. I see it. It's what we all do here on Dad Vice TV. And what is that one? Rallying support, which I argue is obviously one of the most important elements. And we've talked about this already you know, having our loved ones go to the doctor's appointments with us, um, you know, having them have a good understanding of, of what's going on. Because for our caregivers and our loved ones, they're just as scared. And I know, I cannot tell you how many times when I have met someone, you know, at the hospital or, or whatever setting I was in, even in my own personal life, where they've had a condition or they've had something going on and they maybe felt too much shame, guilt, vulnerability and didn't feel comfortable in opening up to other people or fears that, you know, they wouldn't understand what they were going through. And yep. so that, that, that isolates us even further on top of having a condition, you know, that we're trying to understand for ourselves, which is already isolating in many ways. So the people you trust to be there for you, the people you trust to, and, and deserve a seat at your table to hear your story, you know, find those people talk to them, say, Hey, you know, are you available to, to hear me out on, on what I'm, what I'm going through right now? And go ahead. Got a thought. Well, I was going to say, you know, <laughs> it's exactly what, what, you know, it's hard to, to, to describe it. in a way, the dad vice TV community, we support each other, mm -hmm. but that whole, it's somebody, for me, this is a huge support thing also a lot of people think oh james is just telling his story and talking to people um he doesn't need support and i don't i'm not saying that in a negative way um i just want people to know yeah i need support and i'm getting it and i get it mm -hmm. from 
from I share my story so that others can kind of hold me to stick into things. They help me stay mm-hmm. on track. You guys know if I started eating a whole bunch of Wendy's, you guys would let me know how wrong it was <laughs> and help me get back on track. So the people that I I broadcast to here are part of my support. Plus, mm-hmm. they're they're people we we can talk with each other, and we do. We talk in the comments. We talk on Facebook. We talk in other groups like Plant Powered Kidneys, and we understand mm-hmm. each other, and that really makes a huge difference. I can't. I, I have good coworkers that I know, very f- good friends at work. I can't talk to them about a chronic illness or what it really is like, or that. I'm just not having a good day. I'm getting getting really exhausted easy and it's mm-hmm. going to be a tough afternoon. I've got all this stuff on my schedule. They just don't understand that, but I can come to this group here. We are that support group for each other, which is really really Absolutely. great. We can be honest with each other, even sometimes even more honest than we are with our doctors. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I am not a doctor. But people will share things with me and they'll say, I haven't told my doctor yet, but there's this problem. You know, they're, mm-hmm. they, they feel a little embarrassed to tell their doctor. And, and I had to kind of come to grips with that to be honest with my doctor. I kept things from him. Um, I had some serious, serious symptoms weeks early. And I was like, yeah, I'm not going to tell them that that's kind of embarrassing. I don't want, I don't want them looking into that. You know, there's things like, it'll go away. It'll get better. Mm-hmm. Um, but we, we support each other because we, we trust each other. We, we've we been there. Um, mm-hmm. We are there. Um, we I lean on them. They lean on, on me. We lean on each other. We lift each other up when we're not feeling that great. We support each other. Um, but yeah, that's, you know, it's just, it's just amazing. And there's a few people in the comments that are, discussing a few things that are challenging for them. And it's just amazing as we're talking hope, seeing so much support rallied for each other to help each other. Right. And I will say too, that this is invaluable, you know, having this community where you can be like, yes, I am experiencing that too, because doctors, you know, health professionals, your friends and family, they aren't living the experience, even mm-hmm. if your experience is unique as it is. It's so different to just be able to say, I am feeling so tired and I'm having so much shame and guilt for not being able to you know, clean the house, spend time with my loved ones in a way that I'd like, to show up in a way that I'd like. And it causes a lot of shame and vulnerability that these kinds of settings just you know, wipe away. And in, a, in addition, I think that finding someone like a professional therapist or counselor or spiritual leader, you know, someone in your church, um, like a clergyman, finding that person who can give you, who's maybe a little bit removed, um, but does have training in chronic conditions, in depression, anxiety, um, you know, and feeling isolated, that can really help kind of tangle, untangle some of these challenges that you're having. It can help you, you know, validate your experience, but also help in giving you tools that are individualized to you. It can also help with how do you share these things with your loved one when you're so afraid yourself? How do you invite other people in when that shame um, is, is just so high? Mm-hmm. And, and all of those feelings are completely normal. Yes. We, we all go through them and it's kind of like peaks and valleys. Um, there are times if I let my brain start wandering about the future and what ifs, you know, it can paint mm-hmm. worrisome futures. The nice thing is the future isn't in stone. I can Absolutely. make choices. I can do things today and help guide my future in the direction that I would like it to go into. And there's some limitations, right. you know, I'm, I'm, you know, first of all, I'm, a, I'm an overweight, older person. <laughs> I miss my 20s so bad, everybody. <laughs> I miss my 30s too, but, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm not going to be an Olympic gymnast or anything like that. You know, yeah. I got to be realistic in what I would like. Um, but it comes down to, you know, I, I, I find the support. 
you know, that I get from my doctor, from the community. I, anyone who's toxic there. So there's Facebook groups that people ask me, James, why aren't you in these Facebook groups? And they're full of toxic comments that are not helpful. And mm -hmm. I make the decision, you know what? I don't, I, I don't need that because it's going to make my mind when it starts to wander, go more towards that direction. I prefer it not to go. I want to stay focused on the positive, the possible, instead of worrying too much. Yeah, show here, show me bear says me too, James. <laughs> you know, you know that's what I look for. You know, I try to surround myself with good, positive people. Mm -hmm. um, and, and even if I can't talk to them, like you know, I love to say, oh, I can tell my wife everything, but she tries to understand but she can't understand everything she's got enough stuff to worry about so i shouldn't expect her to have to understand everything so it's good to have these support outlets that i can and, talk to and to have those support outlets for our caregivers so like your wife having an outlet to say gosh like what is happening how do i how do i help him when he's you know in a low or what do I do when, how do I take care of myself? How do I manage these uncomfortable feelings that, mm -hmm. you know, maybe some anger or frustration that I, I know I shouldn't have, but I do. And so having opportunities for our caregivers to have those outlets, to have that support is just as important as our own. Yep. And what's the next part of harnessing the power of hope? So it's finding gratitude. So I want to be really, really clear when I'm talking about harnessing the power of hope, it's not just look on the bright side. If you just thought better thoughts, <laughs> things would get better. Because if you could do that, you would do that, right? Mm -hmm. and, exactly. And so, there, <laughs> so there is a varying, I mean, there is a degree that we have to own. We do have to own our thoughts and how we are cho who we are choosing to spend our times with and how much of these negative thoughts we're allowing to kind of rule our lives. But again, gratitude is a practice. It reminds us of what we have when we feel like so much has been lost or taken from us. And so again, you know, connecting, if you're spiritual or religious in, in any way, what does that look like for you? Culturally, what does that look like for you? Communicate your gratitude with your loved ones. Even if it's, you know, honey, I am not feeling great today, but I'm so thankful that I'm here. I'm so thankful you're here. Thanks for making me breakfast. You know, just those little simple things. It, it, if I said that to my <laughs> wife, she'd be like, what's wrong? What did you break? Or what of mine did you sell? <laughs> What'd you get rid of? It, it's, it's just one of those little things. It doesn't cost anything. It takes a second, but it also helps us shift our perspective to look for things that we do have again, when, when it feels like so much has been lost or taken from us, because it's a very real, it's a very real struggle. Yep. Yep. All right. So we've talked about understanding your illness, mm -hmm. managing stress, very important, rallying support. You know, the people around you, we got all us here on the Dad Vice TV community. You got your doctors, your ministers, so many people who can help support you. Finding gratitude, what's number five? Set and work towards goals. So if your goal is improved quality of life, that's, or be happier, or feel healthier, that's great. That's a wonderful goal to have, but we need to consider, okay, short term, what do I need to do to kind of move that dial to get closer to where I want to be while being, you know, realistic, like you were talking about with, I am experiencing this chronic condition and there's a lot that I can't control right now, but can I control my eating? Yeah. Can I control, you know, getting a little bit of exercise, even if it's having like two pound weights, you know, that you keep while you're watching TV or doing commercial breaks. You know, figuring out those manageable bite-sized things that you can do today to have a better tomorrow. Yep. 
most importantly, I will say that the motivation is not always going to be there. You're going to have days where you're hurt. You're going to have days where you're just Mm -hmm. exhausted. You just don't want to. And so motivation is going to come and go. Discipline is what we need to work on harnessing because that's what's going to get us through when that motivation is not there. And if there are going to be days where that happens. Yep. And I'll tell you my motivation and it comes from a lot of different things. You know, um, of course I got to say family, otherwise my wife would get upset, <laughs> but family <laughs> is motivation, but probably my biggest motivation there are things that motivates me that helps get me motivated when I'm kind of feeling like, ah, and people are, there's a whole bunch of people asking about my treadmill. Yes, I'm still using it every day. I'm starting to see results. Uh, wish weight would fall off a whole lot faster than it goes on, but it doesn't. <laughs> but my, the number one thing that I lean on to motivate me, to get me started every morning, to get me going on the right track is music. I have a playlist mm-hmm. and you know, I mentioned, you know, there's there's Dolly Parton, Better Get to Live In. There's all these great songs. Um, I'm trying to think of what the other ones are. I'm so bad at the name of them. If I play them, I'm singing along all the wrong words, but I'm still singing along. <laughs> but music is a huge thing that helps me stay focused on my goals. Helps me kind of block out the world, block out thoughts. Um and and focus on my goals so i lean a lot on music um uh, and it just it helps me accomplish things um uh, and helps me with all of this and the songs i listen to my playlist mm-hmm. they're all very positive they're all very uplifting um uh, and the great thing is my kids i've brainwashed them they love all those songs so you know if I'm kind of getting a little bit grumpy, my daughter will say, Daddy, you need to listen to Dolly Parton. And then she'll say, Alexa, <laughs> play Dolly Parton. I don't want to say it too loud. She'll, she's sitting right behind me in the green screen. <laughs> and she'll start playing music. But, you know, she'll have her, you know, play some music to kind of help me, you know, get refocused and ah, recentered again. Yeah. And realize, hey, feeling bad is normal. And it's something that I can kind of, I can control. It may not be easy, but I can impact that. I can, I can make it a little bit better. And that goes into knowing what your why is, right? So why are you doing these things? And a lot of times it is for family, for health. Mm-hmm. But, but knowing what your why is, that helps with that discipline when the motivation has gone. And scheduling things as a non-negotiable in your day, like getting on the treadmill in the morning. Oh. It's it's just as non-negotiable as brushing your teeth and washing your hands. So yep. And that's that where mindset. a yep. second person is really helpful. If mm-hmm. you have a significant other, a friend or something, there was a, there was a time when I hated X way long ago, way before my kidney problems. Um, I, I just didn't want to exercise and I needed to. So one of my coworkers, she said, Hey, I'm going to do this step class. You're coming with me. It wasn't, would you like to, it was, you're coming with me. And if, if, and, she, and we made it a deal, we would each make sure the other went at the end of these certain days when we had the class, if she didn't want to go, I had to convince her, look, you're going. If I didn't want to go, she convinced me. And we went together, did the steps. It was funny. Everyone thought we were a couple and <laughs> we weren't. <laughs> so we just, we just went along with her like, okay, hey. <laughs> The couples get to get all these extra advantages for co- both coming here and work here. So we, we, we went with it. Um, but having that support to help you for those things, because it's easy to say, hey, every day, nine o'clock, I'm going to get on the treadmill and walk for half an hour. Right. But right. it's also easy to be like, oh, not tonight. And then not tonight turns into another not tonight. Then all of a sudden the treadmill's collecting dust. Um, but my wife and my kids all know daddy needs to get his steps and they help me and they ask about those. Did you get your steps? Mm -hmm. Why aren't you on the treadmill right now? Daddy, isn't your treadmill time? So having that extra, another person to help you, um, you know, it's it's kind of support because they're helping remind you to stay consistent with that and, and kind of helping prevent you from giving up on it, you know? Even if it's only for a day, that day turns into two days and three days as you start, 
you know, I, I do it all the time with exercise. It's one of the, it's probably my, my biggest flaw right now is not sticking with exercise. Gotcha. Very common. <laughs> yeah. Now look at it. We are at the top of the hour. <laughs> It went by so quickly. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I think Deb said, where in the world did the hour go? <laughs> so much great information here. And I'm going to put a link to Lana's blog. It is hanutherapy.com. And Hanu is, you know, Hawaiian. So Honolulu, mm -hmm. correct? Short for that. Very good. It's yeah, we could talk about that another day. It's actually for for, for turtles, um, the Hawaiian sea turtle. It, it it's through wisdom, guidance, longevity. It's it's a number of things. It's a very very sacred creature in in Hawaiian culture. Uh -huh. Oh, very. In I learned something. I learned a lot, yeah. a whole <laughs> lot today. <laughs> All right, everybody, I don't want to run this over too much from the hour. I want to thank you for being here, Lana. This is fantastic. It's great information. And I want to thank everyone out there who's watching. And thank you so much for being my support and the support there for each other. We all give each other hope of kicking kidney disease to the curb. All right, everybody. I'll be back next week, I think on Monday. Yeah, Dr. Rowe back here on Monday. And a few people asked some questions about um, protein and other kidney-related things. Dr. Rowe is the right person to ask those questions for. He can help us how to reduce protein leakage, inflammation, and things like that for those questions. I don't want, I don't want those people to think I was ignoring those. Um, it's just the wrong audience today for that, you know, up here, the guest audience. Um, but Monday, Dr. Rowe will be here. That's the right audience. And we have a packed week next week. Lots of great people. And Lana will be back in two weeks. Mm -hmm. Awesome. <laughs> Woohoo! All right. Thank you so much. And everybody, I'll see you in the next video. Bye. I didn't hit the button. <laughs> <laughs> There it goes. It's a slow load, everybody, if you can still hear me. <laughs> I wish I could turn the camera back on, but I can't. It's, it's already started playing the ending. My hard drive fell asleep. <laughs> Here, let's see. Can I? Oh, I can't turn. Oh, no. It, it gave me an error. This has never happened. All right, everybody. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to manually end this. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you so much.